Buonasera, bentornati al nostro appuntamento con uh, Liberi Oltre Confine. Eh, oggi siamo qui con, con un caro amico, con Terence Schili, eh, che eh, si è occupato nella vita di, di tante cose, è stato vice chancellor, cioè a tutti gli effetti rettore eh, dell'Università eh, di Buckingham per alcuni anni, oggi è adjunct scholar del Cato Institute, si occupa molto di questioni legate al finanziamento della ricerca scientifica, ma ha scritto anche un libro su perché non dovreste fare eh, la prima a colazione eh, la mattina, che ha avuto grande successo eh, nel mondo anglosassone. Eh, ho chiesto a Terence di discutere un po' con noi del modo nel quale l'Inghilterra ha affrontato uh, l'emergenza Covid, ha affrontato uh, la pandemia, perché insomma, un, un po' di tutti i paesi è emerso uh, un racconto non così semplice e lineare in questi mesi. Alcuni governi sembravano aver fatto molto bene all'inizio, hanno fatto male dopo, altri si sono trovati esattamente nella posizione opposta, persino l'Italia. Giuseppe Conte per un certo periodo è stata un modello agli occhi del mondo, è stata raccontata come tale sui grandi quotidiani internazionali, poi uh, invece è maturata un'opinione differente. Eh, quindi eh, mi piacerebbe discutere un po' con lui di come l'Inghilterra ha affrontato la pandemia tenendo presente la particolare situazione nel momento nel quale ci troviamo, cioè per alcuni mesi il governo di Boris Johnson era stato applaudito un po' da tutte le parti per eh, l'abilità nel concepire e eh, eseguire eh, la campagna eh, vaccinale, invece adesso con eh, l'ex variante indiana, variante Delta, che eh, si sta diffondendo in corrispondenza di un aumento eh, dei contagi, il governo mantiene eh, alcune delle restrizioni che avrebbero dovuto essere eh, revocate il 21 di giugno e insomma questo suo eh, comportamento sta contribuendo eh, a, a far eh, serpeggiare diciamo così, qualche dubbio purtroppo sull'efficacia dei vaccini anche eh, da noi e, e soprattutto eh, ci porta un po' a riconsiderare il modo in cui eh, l'Inghilterra ha scelto di procedere eh, con eh, le vaccinazioni cercando di capire che cosa è stato fatto di buono e che cosa invece magari eh, è stato fatto di meno buono questo eh, come dire eh, con lo spirito eh, di imparare da ciò che hanno eh, fatto gli altri che dovrebbe essere quello che poi, eh, che poi ci hanno um, passiamo quindi a questa conversazione in inglese first of all thank you so much Terence for being with us it's a pleasure it always is a pleasure to talk to you Alberto Oh, thank you. Um, now, my first question to you, I mean, you've been following very uh, closely the, the pandemic, first of all, as a citizen, but also, you know, your, bio, your background is in biochemistry, so clearly uh, you got a more nuanced and refined view of what was going on, of what is going on that I may have, uh, for example. Uh, can I ask you um, to uh, basically provide us, you know, with... Um, with a larger picture uh, of what the British government has done and how it has reacted uh, to the um, uh, COVID-19 threat. Because on this side uh, of the channel, you know, we went from you know, considering Boris Johnson a, a buffoon, they wanted to go for herd immunity, then to think he was the greatest chap in town, Uh, because of the vaccine rollout. So uh, I suppose that the matter is actually a bit more complex. Uh, and I would like to ask you, you know, if, if there are some common elements uh, in the different responses and the different policies that the British government has deployed uh, in this uh, pandemic year. Well, the description you've just given isn't completely wrong. Um... So if that is the reflection that the Italian press has been portraying, it's, it's not wrong. I mean, I will talk in greater detail about it, but the overall picture that you have is correct. I think if we want to look in the generality, Boris Johnson, who is a populist, responded very similarly initially to all the other populists. His response was very similar to Donald Trump's or Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, a series of other populists, Modi in India, It's extraordinary how all these populists collectively responded initially the same way, which is essentially by trivializing, by marginalizing the threat from COVID. 
And that's because as populists, they were not engaged in the sort of technocratic, technological approach to government. Theirs is an identity politics and what they're being rewarded for by their electorate is not the details of management of any particular issue actually, it's an expression of national uh, individuality, uh, national identity. That's what they're about, these people. What makes Johnson different from some of the other populists is that he is himself actually a very intelligent person. And we have seen an interesting pivot in his performance, but initially he approached it like all the other populists, he ignored it, he trivialized it. So for example, we have in Britain, a committee called COBRA, uh, which is a cabinet committee for disasters. And the first five meetings, five meetings of this committee held every week to consider the COVID crisis in the early weeks of the crisis, he skipped every single one. He was at Chequers on an extended holiday. Chequers is his country house, the prime, of, prime minister's country house with his new wife and his new child. And he was trying to finish a book on William Shakespeare that he promised his publisher. He'd won an election at the end of last year. He thought he had five or four clear years before having to do anything else. So he thought this was the time to go to his nice free country house and finish his obligations to his publisher. And this uh, infection thing that had come from the Far East, he ignored. Finally, he could no longer formally ignore it. So he publicly ignored it. He came out into the open to say that he was ignoring it. And there was one famous trip to a hospital where he said, I have been to this hospital. There are cases of COVID in this hospital. And I'm proud to say I shook hands with everybody. So he was now no longer ignoring it. He was downplaying it. And of course, the reasons for this, apart from the fact that his, his, his worldview was simply unprepared for a shock from for an external shock, as the economists put it, but also he's deeply committed to a form of government where the interests of the economy and the interests of the uh, capitalist classes is particularly important. And he didn't want to do anything to damage the interests of business. Not in itself a bad thought, you understand. But what this resulted in was him downplaying uh, the virus publicly. And again, he went to a, a rugby match just before the whole country locked down. He publicly went to a rugby match with 50,000 other people to make the point that he personally didn't believe in the virus. Now, you talk about herd immunity. That is far too elegant a term. He just hoped it would be another flu. In fact, he said so. It'd be another flu and it would go away. What changed everything was a mathematical model produced by some epidemiologists at Imperial College in which they simply said, extrapolate from current trends and the National Health Service, our system of healthcare in Britain, which is a nationalized service, and being a nationalized service, it has no spare capacity. It's therefore an exceptionally vulnerable way of running a health service. At any one time in Britain, there are no spare beds in our hospitals. At any one time in Britain, there are no spare doctors or nurses. The health service is run with as little money as possible, just meets demand and never has any spare capacity compared to the German health service where you have competing providers, uh, competing insurance agents, uh, companies and charities, and you have something like 20% of all hospital beds at any one time are standing empty. We haven't had that in Britain for a hundred years. So he was presented with this data by Imperial College that unless something happened very, very quickly, suddenly the health service would be swamped and there would literally be people dying in hospital corridors, dying indeed outside of hospitals in the street because there was nowhere to take them. So you talk about herd immunity, it was nothing so elegant. Up to that point, Boris Johnson didn't want to know. And that is the big weakness. Now, there is actually no excuse, funnily enough. Now, it's easy to say that in retrospect, who am I? But there were governments from day one who treated this in a very different way. You only have to look at South Korea or Taiwan as two exemplary examples. The moment the virus sequence was published by the Chinese scientists, the South Korean government collected in a, in a meeting room in the, a railway station in Seoul, because they were all coming in different trains, uh, the 20 representatives of the 20 largest biotech companies in South Korea. And South Korea hasn't got a very big biotech industry, by the way. It's got a much bigger 
electronics industry than biotech, but anyway, it had a small biotech industry, much smaller than Britain's, collected together uh, the, the 20 leading companies and said to them, what we want from you is track and trace. If you can give us a PCR test, that is to say, where well, everyone now knows what a PCR test, they didn't then, but everyone now knows what that is. We promise you that if you give it to us as quickly as possible, there will be no regulatory burdens. Uh, the regulation will be done immediately. And that's what happened in South Korea. Within weeks, within literally weeks, when the numbers of cases were tiny and the numbers of deaths practically non-existent, South Korea already had tests. And not just tests, the government itself had testing stations throughout the country. You could go to a petrol station, you could go to a hamburger bar, and you could have a PCR test while you're at it, free, run by the government as well as all the other uh, public health uh, testings for people who had symptoms. And then of course they were um, asked to stay at home and all their contacts were traced. The, the point is it never happened in South Korea. There was no pandemic in South Korea. They stopped it before it started. It's the same in Taiwan and other Far Eastern countries. Now they had an advantage over the West. They'd been with SARS and MERS. They'd seen all these other viruses emerging from China. I don't say that, by the way, in any cheap way. I'm not being Donald Trump talking about the China virus. It just is a fact that a significant number of viruses have come out of China in the last 20 or so years. And so China's neighbors have got used to those sort of viruses and they're equipped. They know how they should deal with it. There was no reason why Boris Johnson and the British government at large and other Western governments, especially after what had happened in Northern Italy, for heaven's sake, should not have understood that this was a very serious matter. But in some odd and strange way, there was a denial. It wasn't rational. It was a denial based on the fact, to return to an earlier point, these were not technocrats. They'd come to power on the basis of Brexit. They were going to make Britain great again. The British Empire was going to rule again. The Union Jack would fly all over the world again. We were going to be British and great. And there was no place in that narrative for something demanding technological actions. After Boris Johnson went to hospital and he very nearly died, uh, and he was very lucky to survive, he had the very best possible care, of course, he himself admitted he was absolutely overweight, which is, of course, he's a young man, only in his 50s, but he was very overweight. And that, of course, as, as everyone knows, is a precipitating factor. Thereafter, once it had hit him personally, he then started taking it very seriously indeed. And you could then argue that we, we locked down because everyone else was at that point locking down apart from Sweden. And at that point, Boris Johnson essentially handed over the management of the epidemic and the pandemic to the scientists. And thereafter, the story is very, very simple. Whatever the scientists, particularly the epidemiologists have said, we have largely done. We've always locked down later than everyone else and our results have been terrible. And before the vaccine, we had about more deaths per capita than I think any other country in Europe, actually. I think more than Italy, I think, I think we were the worst performing country of all. And the opinion polls were looking bad for Boris Johnson. But then as you described so accurately, the vaccine, and he did get this right. He appointed Kate Bingham, who's a very well-known venture capitalist, uh, a very able and clever person who I have the privilege, I've, I've known her for 30 years and I, uh, I was one of her professors at Oxford when she was a student. So I can guarantee that she was one of the outstanding members of her generation. He appointed her and he got this right, which is what the European Union, by the way, got wrong. He said to her, you are not to behave like a civil servant. I don't want you to sit there working the most cost effective contracts, giving me all sorts of clauses in case the companies fail, making sure that value for money is optimized. We have to transcend that. We're facing a war here. I want you to go out there. I want you to order, if necessary, four times more vaccines than we could possibly ever use. I do not want you to give any restrictions on profits or any restrictions on the sort of contract that would make companies worry. I want you to basically go out there and buy every company going and forget budgets. And if we spend four billion pounds more than we needed to, but we save lives, that's fine, no one is going to care. Of course, it was nothing like that big. She did spend a lot of money. She spent much more per vaccine than the EU did. But unlike the EU, because she went to so many companies and commissioned so many vaccines, Britain was there first. And she made another very good decision. 
track and trace we had outsourced to the usual companies. And I have to say, and I'm a believer in markets and you're a believer in markets, so the next sentence doesn't come easily to me. But the sort of companies I'm afraid in Britain, in Britain, I can't speak about Italy, the sort of companies in Britain that do well by uh, outsourcing a government contracts have shocking track records, really shocking. This is no secret, by the way. No one's going to sue me. It's very well known that the major companies in this field are always being fined hundreds of millions of pounds for constant... Let me, oh. let me interrupt you on, on, on track and trace. Uh, do I remember correctly uh, that uh, sometimes in the fall, actually, the British government announced massive deployment of fast tests, uh, starting, you know, with some municipalities. I, it may have been Liverpool uh, or something like that, and that basically never happened. Uh, so I'm afraid I that's think, true. Because I, I I was personally looking forward to that because the idea was for England to have something like you know um, capable. Um, testing um, done by quick tests and, and therefore, you know, being able to uh, avoid uh, another lockdown or more restriction because of the ability of keeping uh, basically um, the um, spread of the contagion uh, under track. But that didn't happen, did it? It didn't work. And you're quite right. The sums of money on paper are eye-watering technically, but it never came to this. Technically, the government had put £37 billion pounds aside for track and trace. That figure is, is, is a ridiculous figure, really. If you look at the reality, it was £2 billion. Still a lot of money, but it was just £2 billion. The real failure with track and trace was outsourcing to these companies that specialise in getting short-term government contracts at eye-watering large sums of money and with a constant track record of failure. It just didn't work. It's working properly now, finally. Now it's no longer really necessary. But what Kate Bingham arranged was that the uh, vaccines were done wholly within the National Health Service and within institutions like local pharmacies that have always worked closely with the National Health Service. She did not outsource to the private sector, although she herself is a private sector person. She kept it within the National Health Service, which delivered superbly. And so the vaccine has been a huge success. There is real fury and disappointment in England and Britain today, literally today or yesterday, that the complete relief from lockdown has been postponed for another month. This is an area in which I'm not really qualified to judge. I know that everyone, all the newspapers, or most of the newspapers are very upset by this, but there was an opinion poll yesterday that well, showed- parents, I'm sorry. Uh, just, to, just to clarify, what are the restrictions that are still in place? They're very light. The only restrictions in place now are basically for very large meetings. So you can't go to nightclubs. Theatres are very, you're allowed to have people in theatres, but only a handful of people in theatres. You can only have a handful of people at football matches. So um, where, and, and, and concerts, where you have all these big events, uh, you're only limited to about a quarter of the numbers of people you would normally have before. And nightclubs are still not opening because they're completely inside. Weddings and funerals, they're bigger now. Now you're allowed up to 30 for a wedding and up to 30 for a funeral, but they are lifting that very shortly. But those restrictions are all fairly modest. Um, so I would say the restrictions are modest. Even restaurants are open now. So England has already effectively locked, locked not stopped the lockdown, but there are still sufficient restrictions, particularly pubs and restaurants and nightlife where the social distancing, you know, you can't go to the bar and order a drink, which is what you normally do in England. I know it's different in Italy. Uh, you still have to sit at the table and a waitress has to come to you and get your order. And there are many fewer people in the room than otherwise would be. So the entertainments and um, uh, food industries are still hugely, hugely damaged by the, by the current lockdown and, and uh, theatre and, and sport and stuff. But that's really the only things now. You were saying before uh, that you've seen an opinion poll supporting yes, well, the, the government, I suppose. Yes, the opinion polls are astonishing. I, 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 anyone who thinks the British are a bold, brave, buccaneering race of entrepreneurs 
who, as Boris Johnson would tell us, have been held back by the wicked bureaucrats of Brussels. And if only we were free, we would go out and create a new empire of entrepreneurs, hasn't seen the opinion polls. Two thirds more, 70% of the British people support further lockdowns. There is no popular desire to raise the final restrictions, far from it. Where every time the government in this country clamps down, public opinion supports it more. There is a minority that is infuriated, of course, and this minority is almost identical, curiously, to the Brexit voting people. So there's a minority, a very small minority of intellectuals who are Brexiteers, the right wing of the Tory party, who are also furious about lockdowns. And then there's a significant mass of people uh, you know, not, who didn't go to university, let me just put it that way, uh, who also really resent these, res often because as manual laborers, their own actual labor is inhibited. They actually can't work because they're manual laborers. So they can't just sit at home and work on the internet. They actually have to work. And so they have a commercial and economic reason to be frustrated. But there's also uh, a cultural affiliation between the working class Brexiteer and the intellectual Brexiteer. And these people are genuinely outraged and they make all the fuss. But if you look at the opinion polls, they are absolutely a minority. Every time Boris Johnson locks down on the people of Britain, his opinion poll rating goes up. You were talking about Kate Bingham before, and, and you described her success, you know, in basically a budgetary terms. Uh, can you perhaps um, highlight, you know, uh, what actually you think were, were her best choices? And was it only a matter of money and being ready to pay more? Uh, instead of going for this idea that somehow, since we are in a pandemic, profits should be kept as small as possible uh, in the name of social justice. Uh, no, she didn't give a, a damn about social justice. She was appointed on the 1st of July for exactly six months, so she gave up on the 31st of December. It was a six-month appointment, for which she was not paid, by the way, but you know, she's a venture capitalist, she's not poor, but nonetheless, she did this for six months just to sort this issue out. The only value for money she considered was the absolute number of vaccines. She was not concerned with profits of companies. She didn't consider that to be her responsibility, actually. And if companies are going to profit by it, well, they've taken the risk in developing the vaccine. And don't forget, not all companies' vaccines worked. A significant number of companies' vaccines did not work. But they still had to take because they still had to take the chance of the R and D. So th there's a commercial risk out there. Indeed, we must all remember there was no guarantee on the first of July when she was appointed that any vaccine would work. We we don't have a vaccine for HIV now after I don't know how many decades. And there are many viruses for which there are no vaccines. So the whole concept of the vaccine was a risk. She took a very bold risk by supporting. Uh, or by being part of consortiums with the RNA vaccines. But of course, and she in fact invested in a number of different vaccines. Um, she focused particularly on the DNA vaccines, particularly AstraZeneca, but not exclusively. She, she had a portfolio across the piece. And her feeling was that if Britain ended up with three times more vaccines than it needed, well, so what? We can give them to Africa. Um, so she certainly would not have worried about social justice as you described. And if the companies made good profit, she would have felt they deserved it. She was much more concerned with saving lives. My understanding is that she was not um, particularly driven by any protectionist move. She was not nudged to, uh, you know, help AstraZeneca at the expense of others, right? No, she, she was utterly pragmatic. She certainly would not be a protectionist. She spends half her time in New York anyway. She works in a global company and she works in the global world. Her only concern would have been what's best for the 60 million Britons who need a vaccine against this condition. That's the only concern she'd have had. That's why she was so effective. She had one goal and one goal only. She considered nothing else but the one goal. You spent uh, years in um, thinking about how science should be financed. And, uh, uh, I would say, you know, with, with all the problems we had last year, uh, quite a bit of science uh, went on uh, and 
uh, you know, we, we, we've seen some tremendous scientific accomplishment, particularly when it comes to the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that vaccines are actually available and a good number of them effective um, um, today. So uh, if, you, if you look back you know, at this year of, uh, of pandemic and you think at the way in which government decided to support vaccine production, um, what are the lessons uh, you're willing to take? Um, is your view about the financing of science changed? Uh, do you think the private sector in, 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 in big pharma, you know, in this sense, uh, work well? Uh, do you think that the example of South Korea that you mentioned before uh, is telling us something when it comes to you know, how to have a healthy relationship between government, science, and the private sector? That is a very good question. I'm very glad you raised the subject of South Korea because we learn a lot from South Korea. The pandemic has covered the private sector with glory. These vaccines have come from private sector companies that have behaved magnificently. Some have taken government subsidies, especially in America, where something called Operation Warp Speed was launched by Donald Trump. And this was basically to give large sums of money to companies to develop vaccines. But some companies chose not to take government money. Pfizer, for example, working with BioNTech in Germany, chose not to take government money for research. Equally, BioNTech didn't take government, so it didn't take part in Operation Warp Speed. BioNTech didn't take money for research either, although it did take money later on uh, for upscaling the vaccine and distribution. But South Korea is the best example of all because I haven't changed my mind. The vaccine, the pandemic has confirmed absolutely what the model of science should be. And since you've asked the question, I will answer it. There are two models for the government funding of science. And it's important to get this out because a lot of people are now talking about ARPA and DARPA as if that is the same as the government funding pure science. So let me take two minutes out and explain. Everything is determined by America, whether we like it or not. Thinkers all over the globe think about their own national science policies in relation to what America is doing, because that is just the world in which we live. Now, America did not fund science. The American government didn't fund science at all except in warfare, until 1950. So people forget this, but America became the richest country in the world around 1890, absolutely laissez-faire in science. The, the country they overtook was Great Britain, also absolutely laissez-faire in science. The Industrial Revolution took place in the absence of science. What people forget is that the huge government funding for science in France and Germany yielded no benefit. France and Germany never even converged on Britain until the end of the 20th century. It's a completely different story there. Whereas America not only converged on Britain, but overtook. The two laissez-faire countries were much richer than the two countries where the government funded science, which is France and Germany. And there's a reason for that. In any case, to come back to America, America didn't fund science until 1950, and then only because of the Cold War. But the model they adopted in 1950 was the classic model of government funds pure science, in the expectation that that would then lead to applied science, which would lead to economic growth, i.e. the idea was that the government is correcting for so-called market failure in pure science. Well, in 1957, when the Russians launched Sputnik, which terrified the Americans, the Russians had beaten them into space, and then in 1961, when the Russians launched Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, the general consensus in America was that the linear model had failed. All this money that the government had spent on the NSF, National Science Foundation, on pure science, the Russians had overtaken them. It didn't work. So a second government funding model was then constructed in 1958, immediately after Sputnik. And it was called ARPA and later DARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Administration, later Defense Advanced. And that does not start with science. That is the commercial model. DARPA and ARPA, and the whole world's copying them, by the way. You'll have dozens of ARPAs in Italy soon, I have no doubt. What happens in an ARPA is that someone, generally a government minister, by the way, and there's nothing wrong with that in this context, says, this is our goal. I don't know what the goal could be. It could be a vaccine. It could be a better iPhone. It doesn't matter what the goal is. You set a goal. You then get some technologists out of industry, but only for two or three years. So you then send them back again. They don't do any of the research. They simply manage the projects which they outsource to universities and companies. 
if this goal requires doing science, then you do science, nothing wrong in that. But this is goal orientated research. And it is this model that with the vaccine is held very well. So when the when pandemic came along, the goal was very clear. We want a vaccine for this disease and we're prepared to give you money for this. And essentially Operation Warp Speed and everything that everyone else has done about vaccines or that the Korean government, by the way, did on uh, test and trace was a DARPA model. A government minister said, we need this. And then went out and commissioned the science necessary to produce that technology. That model works not just in government, but in industry. So I would say to you, if there is a legitimate government function, whatever it might be, that a democratically elected government says, we want X, a man on the moon, whatever, then that is a goal. I would hope that, by the way, it wouldn't be as frivolous as that. I'd hope it'd be something like a vaccine or something like better public health or whatever. But whatever that goal is, and the science is then in service of that goal, that is the DARPA model, then that's fine. It works. But that is nothing to do with market failure. That is simply the government saying it is our responsibility as a democratic government to provide these public goods. And obviously a vaccine in the middle of a pandemic is a public good. The other model, the National Science Foundation model, the model I'm afraid that is very strongly held in Italy, as well as France and Germany, that there is market failure in science. So the government has to fund all this pure science because poor markets won't produce enough science of their own. That model has failed time and time again. It should be recognized as having failed. But the reason, Alberto, no one talks about it as having failed is that no one has a vested interest, apart from a handful of libertarian think tanks like yours and the ones I'm associated with, in telling the truth. Scientists love the idea of market failure in pure science because governments give them money for the scientists to spend as they wish. This is called peer review. So you collect a group of scientists together, you say, here's 10 million pounds, please get some peer groups together and give it to your friends and they will give it to you. They love this, scientists. Industry love this. Industry is wrong to love this. Industry thinks it's getting science for free. Industry says we pay all these corporation taxes, unless we're big tech firms in America, of course, they don't pay corporation taxes, but everyone else has to pay corporation taxes. And they think we're getting something back for it. Actually, they're losing. I'll tell you why in a second. But they think it's a good idea anyway, because they think they're getting science for free. And government loves it. Everyone remembers the Medici's subsidizing Galileo and strutting around the streets of Florence saying, look at me, I'm a Renaissance prince and patron of science and technology. And every government minister wants to be like that. In the year 2000, when the human genome was cloned, who stood up and announced the cloning of the human genome? Bill Clinton, although actually the American government funded very little of it. So everyone has this vested interest. So no one points out that it utterly fails. Funnily enough, it does utterly fail. This has been proved time and time again. And the reason is very interesting. There aren't actually that many good scientists. Good scientists are as rare as good artists or good directors of think tanks. These are rare people. If you take them out of industry and put them in university labs or special research labs and give them vast budgets and say, research what you want, they'll do very good work, but you've taken the best people out of industry. And therefore, when industrialists research, invest in their own research, they get poor returns. And so they invest less. And that's one of the reasons why American industry is so successful. Because, and this is often not really recognized, America closed down its, the research of its DARPA somewhere in the mid 70s, the details. I've written about the details, I'll give you the details. And the scientists who were sacked from DARPA all went out to Silicon Valley and worked for Xerox Park and invented the modern world. It was from these people uh, at Xerox Park uh, that Bill Gates and um, uh, Steve Jobs stole all their ideas. Quite openly, the story is very well known. It was because they closed DARPA that these scientists were liberated back into the private sector. And that's why America is so successful. There are still fantastic scientists in the private sector in America. And there's been a huge decline in America of government funding of science, often not recognized. But on the continent, including Italy, I'm afraid, your governments, like the French and the Germans and the British, of course, invest very generously in pure science. All the best scientists are taken out of industry, put into the universities and the research institutes, and therefore industry suffers because it hasn't got the research capacity it needs.
Well, one of the reasons why the linear model is still, uh, you know, um, basically an article of fate, as you pointed out a number of times, uh, is because you got uh, scientists uh, lobbying for it, uh, basically, and active, I mean, um, clearly, legitimately, in a world of you know, a plurality of pressure group, uh, but really, I mean, acting like a vested interest. Um, how do you see, you know, the interjection of uh, the world of scientists uh, and the world of politics after the pandemic? I mean, on the one end, uh, I suppose uh, some scientists have never been uh, more influential than they are now. Uh, you know, um, epidemiologists uh, took over the place of advisor to the prince from economists in many, many countries. At the very same time, at least in some countries, including uh, Italy for sure, uh, you know, uh, the debate uh, among scientists has not been um, particularly different than the debate among politicians. I mean, scientists seem to be uh, you know, taking a position on how to contain the virus or how to uh, reduce contagion, that very often uh, was motivated by, say, extra uh, scientific or meta scientific uh, reasoning. Uh, so on the on the one end, you know, they they are more powerful than they used to be. Um, on the other end, you know, it's not so clear that their prestige in the public mind uh, is still on the rise. And of course, a society that doesn't properly consider science, but a society that looks down on scientists, um, you know, is problematic uh, in some sense, isn't it? I bet you've asked you a very good question. Let me just clear one thing on the side, His, but I want to address your question because it's a very good one. But just one thing on the side, funnily enough, when it comes to the linear model, it's not so much the scientists. This, of course, the scientists have always said we need more government funding, of course. It was the economists that made all the difference. It was when people like Ken Arrow said to the American government, actually, the scientists are right. They do need more money. That's when the rot set in for the linear model. But of course, it was hugely dishonest. The economists were all absolutely in hock to the scientists because they had, they had a joint vested interest, which was the health of their universities. The National Science Foundation is generous to economics as well as to other sciences. And so the economists were actually the ones who made all the difference. And they were actually curiously allied in these vested interests with the scientists. But let me take your general question. Of course, some scientists are now famous. Dr. Fauci in America must be one of the best recognized names in the whole planet. And I think he's 80, it's not bad for a man of his age. You're absolutely right. You cannot trust scientists. And this is a very great problem, by the way. A great man called John Ioannidis is a professor of epidemiology, actually, at Stanford University in California. And he published 10 years ago a paper with a truly terrible title, Half of All Published Findings Are Wrong. Half of All Published Findings Are Wrong. Half. And this has been confirmed time and time again. At any one time, Alberto, half of the stuff appearing in the scientific literature is wrong. And we know why, for exactly the reasons you've described. Scientists are all too human and they adapt their so-called findings to the interests of themselves or their funders or some other purpose that they think they're serving. Um, so, I mean, just a, a very, very trivial example that comes out of my own work. Uh, you in Italy, perhaps, certainly in the Western world, we are all told that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. This is a very well known saying in Britain and America. It's completely untrue. Breakfast is a dangerous meal. I've written a book about this. I wrote a book about it, not because breakfast is so interesting, but to explore how a completely false idea gets captured and captures the scientists through their vested interests. And so scientists, even ones not funded directly by the food companies, go around saying that breakfast is the most important meal of the day and alter their results 
to show it because it's so easy to alter their results. What I need is found is this. In areas like physics or physical chemistry or mathematics, the level of honesty is huge. But the moment you go into a field of science like is coffee good for you or is fat good or bad for you, when you have to collect many statistics and much data and you can then select what you publish, dishonesty becomes utterly rampant. So if half of all published findings are false across the piece in science, in nutrition, perhaps 95% of all published scientists have findings of false because scientists are determined to show that fat is bad for you and carbohydrate good or whatever is the fashion of the day. This makes it very difficult when it comes to the pandemic, genuinely difficult. There are some scientists who believe we should lock down and wear face masks and others who believe this was an overreaction and that we could have a much more selective policy of sequestering some vulnerable people away from society, but letting young people who are generally safe continue. And scientists brought their prejudices to those debates. Einstein said that it is theory that determines what we observe. Most people think that scientists observe and then draw theory. But Einstein, the greatest scientist of the 20th century, said it's exactly the other way around. Scientists approach the world already with a theory in mind, and then that determines what they observe. So if you believe that lockdowns are the way forward, then you will find the data that confirms that. If you believe an alternative, you will find the data that confirms it. And unfortunately, it's only after all these different ideas are tested exhaustively empirically that we ultimately get to the truth. So the classic example is fat. All of us were brought up to believe that fat in the food in the food was dangerous and that we should all eat lovely carbohydrates. And it turns out to be the exactly other way around. But it took something like 50 years for that full story finally to be corrected because every new generation of scientists believed that fat was bad for you and they selected the data that fulfilled their suggestions. So yes, scientists are going to be very important because no one is going to have the courage if they're not scientists to stand up and say they're wrong. So I don't think the standing of individual scientists will necessarily fall. But the truth is, half of all published data, published findings are wrong. Scientists are as prejudiced as anyone else. They come with their own prejudices. Science is going through what's called, at the moment as we speak, a reproducibility crisis. Paper after paper after paper, when people try to reproduce it, turns out not to be reproducible. This is accepted. I'm not telling you anything unusual here. Everybody in science knows that science is in the middle of a reproducibility crisis. Everyone knows that scientists are hugely biased by their sources of funding. So the, the one thing that we look for, science, to tell us how to run ourselves is actually very, very fallible. And there is no easy answer to this, by the way. There's no simple solution to this other than to have a very high degree of skepticism about anything a scientist says. And almost as a matter of policy, if I was a government, almost as a matter of policy to seek out conflicts between scientists, to find scientists who disagree with the consensus and try to work out which of these different sources of scientific input might be true. But if you just believe one group of scientists and don't actively seek dissent, you're making a mistake. In a sense, um, science as an enterprise should be exactly that. I mean, uh, figuring out a way to test hypotheses, to falsify uh, theories, and, um, and, and somehow you know, develop protocols. Uh, by which we can come, you know, to at least a temporary approximation of truth, isn't it? The way to understand scientists is as advocates and not as judges. The mistake we all make, or 99% of people make, is to assume scientists are like judges, that they weigh the evidence on both sides and reach a conclusion as dispassionately as possible. They do not, I'm telling you, they do not, we wouldn't have had the whole business of paradigm shifting if, if that's how scientists behave. The reason we have paradigm shifting is that scientists don't behave that way. Scientists should be seen as advocates. In court, they either believe one side or they believe another. 
they will never lie. Scientists rarely actually lie. They do sometimes lie, by the way. Something like 3% of observations in the scientific literature are actually lies, but that's actually quite a small percentage. The vast majority of scientists simply select the data they want. Now, in some areas, this barely happens. I can assure you that the physicists at CERN, all 5,000 of them keeping close eye on each other, looking at them, those people are not selecting their data, or if they are, it's even worse than I suspected. But I'm prepared to guess that CERN is a pretty honest organization. But your average, I mean, when I looked at the epidemiology of breakfast, if you want me to talk to you about epidemiologists, the epidemiology of breakfast is one huge scientific crime. The epidemi and this includes the best scientists from Cambridge in England and in Harvard in America. These are the two best universities in the world. Their epidemiologists have looked at breakfast, they've published on breakfast, and their papers are distortions of reality. So epidemiologists are absolutely part of the group of scientists who are problematical, the ones who select data because of a preconditioned end. It's, it's, it's a very great problem, that. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I think I'm rambling, so I, I let you ask the next question because I'm now forgetting the question I'm trying to get the answer to. <laughs> well, you know, Kitesh, I think um, I've already taken um, so much of your time, but I think it's, it's a very good takeaway from this conversation that data don't speak by themselves. Because when it comes you know, to uh, some groups that are uh, at least as dangerous as scientists and public opinion, uh, which is journalists and influencer. I mean, people that 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 make uh, the opinion of a country any given day. One of the tendency, uh, which is really paramount over there, is this idea that you know we we just need the data, uh, and the data by themselves will magically uh, solve the problem. But that's not the way in which it works. If you have taken this lesson away, you are so wise, Alberto. Someone has selected that data. As Albert Einstein said, it is theory that determines what we observe. My lesson is slightly different from yours, but they've built on each other. My lesson is every scientist is an advocate. If you're a consumer of science, you must see yourself as a judge. I'm talking now particularly of the English system of law, the common law, where uh, it's based on conflict between advocates. It's slightly different from the continental system. If you have a group of scientists telling you something, and you are the judge or the prime minister, you have to make a decision. You should seek out contrarians, however unpopular they may be, because very often the greatest scientists start off as contrarians, as we both know. You should seek out contrarians. You should seek out scientists who say that they disagree. And you should try to do your best to set yourself up as a judge between two sets of advocates. Never believe any scientist without trying to find a contrarian point of view to enable you ultimately to try to make a balanced judgment like a judge in the British system of law. Thank you very much, Terence. It's been a pleasure as always. <laughs> eh, grazie, grazie mille a chi ci ha seguito uh, questa sera. <laughs> Prego.